Hi everyone, I'm famous new media artist Jeremy Bailey. Super excited to be here, surrounded by so much technology as well. I think it was space was curated for me. It feels really, I feel really at home. Um, normally I would give like a three hour, you know, the standard artist presentation about three hours long, maybe condensed down to an hour um, with a lot of dry coughing and, and so on in between, maybe some uh, Perrier. Anyway, but I only have 15 minutes today. Already I'm running out of time. Um, so I, I, I thought to myself, I, I've been in this situation before. Actually, I thought I had a half an hour, so I have half as much time. As, as the talk goes on, you'll find me speaking quick, more and more quickly, really, just to try and deal with these incredibly stressful circumstances. Anyway, so if I'm a famous new media artist, I love technology. When I have a problem like that, I think, Jeremy, how can you solve that? And actually, I came prepared today. I thought, you know, I can solve this. I write software that solves some of the world's biggest problems. Um, I use my privilege and wealth to uh, make the world a better place. And my uh, tech savvy really helps with that. One idea I had, um, and I've been in this context before, uh, thinking about what I, you know, how are others solving this problem? Often when I'm in a situation where I don't know, you know, what to do, I think, how have others done this? How have they done it better? And I thought actually museums came to my mind, Jeff. So when museums are really, really incredible at, um, at taking a lot of information, like I have to take, um, I don't know, a decade of my career and condense it down to 15 minutes. How am I going to do that, right? So museums do that really, really effectively. They take hundreds, if not thousands of years, and they condense it in a way where you can spend about two seconds looking at a painting that might have taken 10 years to make. Um, and, and then they, they have a nice didactic on the wall that makes you feel like you understood the work. So I'm going to be able to do that today for you. Now, how am I going to do that, right? I just got my hands, my body here. I noticed that I'm gaining a little weight. Not really important to this, this talk today, but I notice every time. Um, now, what, what, I, what I can do is I, I program augmented reality software. And in augmented reality, I can take the regular world and, and make it, you know, I can combine it with software. And so watch what I'm going to do here. Watch, I, so I program something. Check this out. <gasps> What's that? Cube. Oh, cubes. You said, Jeremy, that's not very impressive. But look, they're following my fingers. Uh, did you come all the way here just to show us you could put cubes on your hands? No. Make no mistake. These are not just cubes. These are not just... I don't know if cube's actually even the right term. What's a cube rectangle? Anyway, so parallel? No, I don't. Anyway, I don't know what they are, but they're actually in the museum context. These are really powerful. This is really powerful. This is really the shit. These are plinths, right? And so a plinth, we all know if we've been to a museum, makes anything powerful. You can put a cigarette package or a piece of saran wrap on a plinth, and it's going to be powerful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of the work I've ever done and try and present it to you on exhibitions. Look, here's how it works. Look, so I've got these plinths. I can curate an exhibition. Uh, here's an exhibition of some of my work. I can change it up. Look, here's some, here's some recent work uh, from, well, the last century. We've got uh, Brancusi, we've got a, a Duchamp there, a Coons, and hey, brands, right? Because it's contemporary. So I can just have uh, a, an exhibition on my fingers and then, and hey, look, I can even have titles. So I, I've, I've programmed this to come up with titles randomly. It's an algorithm that sort of scans, oh, it's a little bit hard to read, but corruption, everybody knows. Oh, that's an interesting name. But I can just sort of twiddle my fingers and, and get a new, ooh, genius, 21st century. That actually seems like an appropriate title, but I could keep going, twiddle my fingers and I get, ooh, after the moment. Ooh, I want to see that show. Ooh, enter the dragon. Ooh, maybe there's an Asian influence there or something racist. Okay, so <laughs> let's keep going. Let's, let's look at, I'm going to give you a little bit of mythology, a, an exhibition. Oh, well, that's what museums do, right? They put things in context. So I'm going to give you some context on my work, and we're going to start back in the 1960s. Ooh, remember the 1960s? No, a few of us do, actually. I was just talking to someone who remembers the 1960s, don't you, Tanya? Um, <laughs> Now, I, I'm going to tell you a story about how my work came to be, how I came to exist, and it's going to be, uh, it's my story. I own the story. I'm the museum, uh, so shut up. Uh, I set, uh, it's my authority. So uh, I, I'm sort of influenced by performance. I come from a performative background, as you can tell, kind of. Um, and if you look at the history of performance, in the 1960s, there was a really exciting thing happening. There was a guy in a pink suit, clearly, and there was a sculpture here. Uh, but really, there were people performing for other people. And that was a really new idea. This, I, these, these people called fluxist artists, I actually never... Hey, Tanya, I want to get a clarity on this. Could I say fluxist? No, I couldn't, right? They made it almost impossible to refer to them. Anyway, <laughs> the fluxist artists 
were really interested in, well, they were really angry at the bourgeoisie. And they thought, well, how can we really stick a middle finger up at the world? What we could do is make the work impossible to sell. It could, be, it could exist only in our heads. The best way to describe it, actually, is for me to do it with one of you right now. Uh, let's see, you in the glasses. I know I don't really know you, but I love your glasses. And I feel like right now we've got a connection going and there's some warmth. And maybe there's like even at the, the front temple of your forehead, you're getting a little bit warm, maybe feeling like everyone's looking at you. And maybe that's an artwork that we just created called Warm and Fuzzy. And isn't that wonderful? And we're going to talk about it later. And no one else is ever going to have the experience we just had. This artwork belongs to you and I. Isn't that amazing? So I think so. What's your name? Bra. I call it Ron. Ron? Ron. Bra. No, bra. What? Bra. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, that's even cooler. And I'm going to remember your name forever. <laughs> ra, ra, ra. That's the name of the work, warm and fuzzy. Anyway. So, of course, when I was a young, uh, young lad, and I'm already running out of time, aren't I, Joe? I was really interested in another artist. Uh, his his name was Chris Burden, so I'm gonna skip over the piano. Who cares about pianos? Uh, Chris Burden, as a young artist, was like the guy. He was the macho guy. He had himself shot. I couldn't believe it. And he, he, he was famous for not documenting his work or not wanting to document it. Here's some documentation. I have in a little magazine I made. Um, but this doesn't exist in a real magazine. It's a virtual one. Um, but that, to me, he was like, you know, imagine myself, a young 20-year-old, really confident and cocky. Um, the guys we all love, right? The people we all fall in love with. <laughs> uh, well, I thought, well, Chris Burden, he must have just been amazing like can you imagine what a rock star anyway one day I did find documentation of his work but he was famous for saying I don't document my work I still say the same thing and then I did find documentation and it was in a really disappointing uh, moment for me because I had built this experience up in my head can you imagine teachers had told me I'd read about it in art books and then the day came where I actually saw this documentation and it was on film and it was just like a 10 second clip and the audio was out of sync it was really grainy and he kind of you hear just like a thud like a kind of and then he just holds his arm and walks off and it was just such a letdown for me there were no cheers there were no girls sort of asking if he could come out back there was none of that there was no no excitement and so I, you know, that's where I learned, hmm, you know, the documentation, uh, that must, that, you know, that, they were, that was really, uh, that was really uh, not fair that I even saw that, really. It was better, it was, I had to have been there, right? We had to be there. We had to have that moment, Ra. So moving on to the 1970s, um, you know, the, the, this issue of documentation, it kind of persists, right? And I, this, so we're getting to where I, you know, I come from. Oh, it's called Leap Before You Look. Wait, maybe this exhibition is called, no, it's not Enter the Dragon. We've already had that. Corruption, everybody knows. Oh, this, they're kind of repeating. Um, okay, so in the, in the late 1960s, there's a revolution in documentation that happens. Sony comes out with this thing called the Porta Pack. See there on the little ad? There's a little man, he's looking at some Tweety birds there, some little, some little baby birds. Now he's up in that tree, that's revolutionary. I don't know if you understand that this man is going to shoot these baby birds on video and take it down to the living room to show his family. They're all going to gather around the television just moments after he's shot this video. He didn't send the film off to get processed and have a separate audio guy recording the audio. He just recorded it on the first ever consumer video device and he's going to share that with his family, this amazing scene. I just got up into a tree and filmed these baby birds or taped these video baby birds. That's, that was a revolutionary act. It was so revolutionary, in fact, that there was an artist at the time named Nam June Pike, one of those Fluxus people that I just mentioned, and he, this is myth, and some people have debunked it, but let's just go with it. He walked into a Macy's department store the day the, the thing came out. He walks in, picks it up off the shelf, unwraps it, a parade is going by outside. He records that parade going by and shows the video in the gallery that in Soho that day, that very evening, and calls it video art. That moment was revolutionary because the first time that someone had sh recorded and shown something in the same day, and that was a revolutionary act. That was considered like, wow, so close to the real thing. We were so close, so close to that raw moment, right? I can almost feel the parade. Well, so what do artists do with this? Like a lot of technological devices, it's actually kind of clumsy. It ended up in the corners of a lot of studios. It was, as you can see, he has a little purse on there. That was actually a recording device with tape and it came unwound. And it was just, if you talk to people who have ever used it, has anyone ever seen a porta pack or used one? You did? did you got electrocuted. <laughs> That was state of the art. <laughs> it's like you were, and you were lucky. You were happy to be electrocuted. <laughs> so you were happy to be electrocuted. Unfortunately, eventually the buzz wore off, the hype wore off, and a lot of these ended up in the corners or back rooms of, of various artist studios. However, 
artists found this really interesting little technical detail that was available to them. So you could, um, hang on, I'm just gonna, you could, here's an old friend of mine, Colin Campbell, you could hook up your video camera to a TV and watch yourself as you recorded. So remember Namdrew Pike went and recorded that parade. Colin Campbell here, Toronto-based video artist that made fun of Toronto for years in a wonderful way, um, as, and the art world here. <laughs> I'm inspired by him greatly. Um, he would you know, look at himself on camera as he was recording himself, and he realized that there was something different than that, dif different about that, and, and different than, it wasn't documentation, it was performance for a device. And the best way I can ever describe sort of what that feels like, Rosalind Krauss wrote this essay called The Aesthetics of Narcissism, and the way I've condensed it for most audiences is to think about the last time you ever had a phone call and there was a little bit of feedback, like you heard the other person on the line, and how that felt, right? Seeing just even the, mi just that little bit of microsecond delay, the fact that your reflected audio is a little bit different than the real you and what you're used to hearing. That creates a self-awareness, right? What happens when, when you get that call? You're like, hey, can you hear that? Uh, no, you can't. We got to organize the, the day, dinner date. I, I don't have time for this. And, and, and then eventually you're like, okay, I'm going to act normal. So this idea of acting normal emerges at this time. And artists like Colin start to play with their own body, their persona. At, in, and in that in combination with God, by the way, this is the first time I've ever been on television. Prior to now, I would have had to have been like a murderer or like famous to be on TV. They start to play though with their just like their normal lives as this, this like these lives of fame and persona, like acting normal is important suddenly. And this is the first time that people start to think about performing for devices. In fact, they call it performance for the camera at the time. That, I just really condensed a lot of theory and history down to potentially a confusing statement. However, <laughs> That's the gist of it. So, moving on, we get to the 1980s and 90s. Kind of my, I, I'm born, uh, which is good. Um, so now it's maybe a little more relevant. I think I was paying attention <laughs> starting around five years of age. And the thing that changes at this time is that people start performing for computers. Um, not really, they start hooking cameras up to computers. And specifically, I'm interested in an artist named um, David Rokeby at this time. Actually, let me just show you. I have a little cinema that I built under the, here we go. David Rokeby create, uh, every uh, museum, by the way, has a cinema in the basement. Uh, David Rokeby created a performance, or he wrote software actually. Not, he wouldn't call these performances. Hang on, I'll just turn up the audio. Do we have audio? Do, do, do. Yes. Okay, that's all the time we have for it, <laughs> for David. So David, you can watch on the little SC here. So David's performing for a computer there, and you can see, uh, you can still see it's going on there. Um, and what's different about it is that he would tell you that this is documentation. He's not performant. This isn't performance for a computer. It's not like the self-reflective performance of the 1970s. And it's also not performance for another human being. This is him sort of in the trying to document what it's like for the computer in a way to use him. Now, let me explain what I'm talking about, why this is different. He's not self-reflective, that's the first concept. The second concept here is brought to us by Stalin. And basically, <laughs> if you've read Marx, there's this great distinction between a tool and a machine, right? A tool is something that uses your mode of force, a machine is something that uses you. The example Marx uses, I believe, is like a, a child working in a canning factory or something like that. He has a terrible uh, analogy that's very emotional, but the idea is like, you know, the machine uses up your body until you're nothing left. You're just a dead child on the floor and then they bring in the next kid to keep using the machine, right? And what's, what I theorized when I was in grad school is, well, I love David Rokeby, by the way. I'm, I'm, I hang out with him, we're represented by the same gallery, but when I look at this video, let's just go back to it for a second, I think, Who's in control here, right? If the 1960s artist was like, God damn it, you're not even gonna document my work. And then the 1970s artist was like, hmm, this is interesting. This documentation is kind of a different kind of work. The 1990s artist that's performing for the computer is thinking like, what the hell is going on here? I mean, <laughs> he's just, he's trying to detect how the machine works. The machine in a way is performing him. So that was a huge insight for me as an artist. And I started to think about what would it be like if David was aware of what was going on? And that's a terrible way of, a uh, terrible position to put David in. How, and I've talked to him about this. I think it's just really interesting to consider the computer and performing for the computer the same way the 1970s artist behaved. So I started making work um, on the internet about that a little bit, um, and before the internet actually, and I don't have time too much to show uh, what I was doing. Let me just quickly actually go back. Oh no, hang on. I started making videos, um, yeah, this is a good one, where I would sort of reinvent 
things that already <laughs> existed on the computer and perform with them in real time. The idea of it being in real time was super important to me because again, just like the 1970s artist, I wanted to react to the moment, just like the Fluxus artist, I wanted to create a raw. Um, and so I started writing software and reacting to it in real time and sort of dealing with the errors and mistakes and reflecting that back on a persona that emerged uh, into what you see before you today, which I call famous new media artist Jeremy Bailey. Now something really interesting happened while I was in grad school. Um, while I was in grad school, art sort of progressed um, through and became, and, sorry, media progressed and uh, video sort of progressed from being something that was um, you know, again, just between you and the technology to something that was shared in a network. Sorry, this is just, I don't know why video of my wife's mouth is in here. That's just a woman stretching and some bunnies. Anyway, I started to see other artists doing uh, things on the internet where just like the artists from the 1970s, this is Petra Courtright, they were really um, reflecting on the media. They were thinking about what the technology was doing to change the reflection or change the meaning of who they were and what they were doing. So I love this Petra Courtright video because she's using like mid-2000s webcam software and just scrolling through different effects. And those effects are, you know, happy, fun pizza and ladybugs. And her simple performative gesture is to sort of look sad and blasé, right? And so, you know, it's she's really self-aware about how the technology might be you know, interacting with her reflection. And I, that, that self-awareness is something that, again, I don't know David Rokeby would say. So Petra would say, hey, this is the work. This is not documentation of the work. This is itself the work. And she would also position this within other videos she was seeing on the internet. To make that more clear, that point, I like to look at Anne Hirsch, who was another artist um, working at the time with performance on the internet. And she was specifically making videos for YouTube, which came out in 2005. And I started doing the same thing and looking at the aesthetic of YouTube and what other people were doing. She noticed that there were a lot of women doing these things called sort of cam whore performances, but basically like asking men, what should, you know, what should I dance to today? Or what do you, would you like me to wear? And they would get tips and stuff like that. And they would build up these huge audiences based on their relationships with people, with an audience. So it was really kind of a weird moment where, you know, going back to the 1960s, they're performing for people, but there's like this technological mediation that's happening. And Anne Hirsch really was like trolling, and I consider trolling a kind of performance for the internet. But I just became really fascinated with this idea of the internet now as a camera. And so that's what I think Anne was doing, what Petra started uh, to have me thinking about. And then I came up with a statement at that time. How much time do I have? I'm way over, aren't I? Yeah, okay, I'm gonna wrap it up. <laughs> I gave up this a statement at the time, which is I'll make more artwork of less value faster. And the idea, again, what Jeff said earlier about streams and websites not really being the thing, streams were emerging Facebook and Twitter, and it seemed to me, to me among my friends and I that performing on the internet meant performing for these algorithms, performing for these streams. And so I made a lot of videos, a lot of bad ones, uh, but it didn't matter. It was about generating and responding to the media in real time. It was about that real time experiment, kind of. So um, I'm running out of time. I made a lot of videos that way, which I can you know, kind of skip through, but I, I, I sort of out of that emerged this persona, famous new media artist, Jeremy Bailey. Of course he's famous. We're all famous on the internet. Um, we all have a right to be. Technology made us powerful, right? Um, and I've created, I guess, like dozens of videos that way. But over the last few years, I've started to think about um, instead of just the internet, kind of everything as a camera, the whole technology sector as a camera, and performing for technology now means performing for technology as a culture. Um, if you look kind of at the state of affairs, like in the 1960s and 70s, the Rolling Stones were what affected culture. Today, it's potentially Apple or Google. And that's like problematic in all kinds of horrible ways you, we all know. But it's really fun to think of it um, as, 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 for me anyway, as something that I can perform against a baffle, a, a kind of a camera. And so I do things like make patents now, portraits of people that are crazy. I have communist iPhone cases. I have a museum that follows you in banner ads all over the internet. Um, I recently, uh, made my wife uh, pregnant in VR. Uh, we're collaborating together on a virtual reality pregnancy. It's an incubator uh, and startup. I started an accelerator program for artists called Lean Artists that leverages startup culture uh, in the best way to create empathetic companies. I believe that companies can be artworks. I recently created an artificial intelligent being, a second persona created by this persona called Jeremy Bailey Next, who's performing on Saturday at the Music Gallery. Um, anyway, I keep doing all of this stuff. Um, this one's called Bloodlines, uh, <laughs> this exhibition. Uh, and, and that's sort of a summary of my work in the most condensed form. There's lots of stuff. It's best viewed online, actually, not best viewed on my museum hand. Um, 
and or in real time, just like I'm presenting to you today. But that's kind of it in summary. Uh, except that I did add one ex extra thing here, uh, which is you know now that we have a little exhibition up, we can also have an opening. And uh, what the opening is complete without lasers. There we go. So, <laughs> um, that's my work, and. <laughs> And I guess I'm going to be available for questions later. Um, but thank you so much. And yeah, thanks. That's it.